Welcome to the Workers' Reading Room. Today I'll be reading American Trade Unionism by William Z. Foster. This is Chapter 15, Labor and Politics. From the very beginning, the progressives fell into step with the new class collaboration movement of the bosses and AFL top leaders. In fact, they became its most skilled and enthusiastic leaders, and they were its instructors to the Gompers' green bureaucracy. It was the progressives, Johnston and Bayer, who originated the BNO plan. Johnston, Stone, and Hillman were the outstanding champions of the demoralizing labor banking movement, which I christened trade union capitalism, and which dovetailed into the whole class collaboration movement. And Stone and Hillman were among the chief theoreticians of the higher strategy of labor. This theory was thus stated at the Philadelphia Convention of the Amalgamated Clothing Workers, quote, We have our problems, and fortunately it is not necessary to apply the weapon of the strike for the solution of many of them. We have passed in our industry from the days of the jungle into an era of civilized ways of dealing with employers, end quote. Progressives and Socialists Support Class Collaboration The Socialists were equally ardent supporters of the BNO plan, labor banking, and the class collaboration movement generally. Many of them hailed it as the road to socialism. Abe Cahan baldly repudiated Marx as outmoded and the Socialist Party struck out all reference to the class struggle from its membership application forms. Its attacks against the Soviet Union was redoubled. Internationally, the Socialists were no less enthusiastic about the class collaboration developments. The British Labour Party, German Social Democracy, in fact the whole Second and Amsterdam Internationals joyfully hailed capitalist rationalization and the quote, new capitalism. They spun many tricky theories about its developing into an organized capitalism, a super-imperialism that was evolving directly into socialism. Henry Ford became the messiah of the international socialist movement. The American socialist-led unions, mostly needle trades, became practically indistinguishable from ordinary AFL unions. They practiced class collaboration intensely in all its newer forms. They were infested with gangsters. Democracy was practically unknown among them. And they pushed the expulsion campaign against the left wing to further limits than any other union in the United States. Moreover, their leaders, dropping the last vestiges of the traditionalist socialist opposition, became part and parcel of the reactionary AFL ruling clique. On this phase, let witnesses friendly to them testify. Quote, After the World War, the socialist boring from within policies and tactics were completely reversed. Instead, they aimed to sue for the confidence and goodwill of the entrenched labor leaders. The new political alignment of the socialists with the administration forces marks the end of their leadership of the opposition in the labor movement. The socialists gave up their policy of militant boring from within and sought to win the confidence of the AFL administration. End quote. The role of the progressives during this period merits closer examination. Dropping all pretense of struggle, these vacillating elements fitted themselves entirely into the new intensified class collaboration and speed up policies of the bosses, and indeed became their most ardent champions. The first of the progressives to so hoist the white flag were the right wing elements. These, grouped around the railroad unions, were organized in the Conference for Progressive Political Action. The Socialist Party was also an active factor in this organization. The CPPA contained about three million organized workers and farmers. These masses clearly wanted a labor party, but their progressive leaders, after talking radically about a labor party during the period of a sharper struggle after the war, sensed the new turn of events toward class collaboration, and therefore ran the whole movement into the ditch. At the Cleveland December 11, 1922 conferences of the CPPA, they definitely repudiated the plan of forming a labor party, endorsed the AFL nonpartisan policy, and, making complete peace with the AFL leaders, they soon set sail together for the La Follette fiasco of 1924. The right wing progressives then completed their surrender by unceremoniously dumping overboard their plumb plan of government railroad ownership, cancelling their inter union solidarity agreements and soon becoming the very leaders in the developing movement for intensified class collaboration. The left wing of the progressives, the Fitzpatrick Farmer Labour Party group, with whom the TUEL and Workers Party, the name of the Communist Party at that time, were cooperating, held out several months longer against the new conservative trends in the labour movement, but they also finally went to the right. 
Fitzpatrick had denounced the Cleveland decisions of the CPPA as rank betrayal of the Labor Party movement and had formally agreed with the Workers' Party to call a national convention in Chicago July 3, 1923, at which a new Labor Party would be launched, provided there were at least 500,000 workers represented. The Workers' Party was officially invited to attend the convention, and it accepted, but the Socialist Party, which followed the line of the right progressives to the camp of La Follette and intensified class collaboration, declined the invitation. It was in the months preceding this 1923 convention that the TUEL and the Workers' Party campaign for the Labour Party took on its broadest mass character. Meanwhile, the Gompers' leaders, strengthened by the rising wave of prosperity, the growth of class collaboration policies, the decline in the workers' fighting spirit, the spread of prosperity illusions among the toilers, and the collapse of the CPPA, felt themselves able to begin to put pressure on the Fitzpatrick Knuckles group. In June 1923, therefore, they cut off 50% of the Cleveland Federation of Labor's monthly subsidy and threatened to reorganize the CFFL if it did not break its alliance with the communists and stop agitating for amalgamation, the Labor Party, and Russian recognition. This coercion had an effect and the CFFL leaders began visibly to lose interest in the coming Labor Party convention. When the July 3rd convention assembled, there were present some 600 delegates representing over 600,000 organized workers and farmers, besides several important unions, ACW and others, that sent observers. From the start, it was evident that the Fitzpatrick group wanted to break its relations with the Workers' Party, although, only shortly before, they had specifically invited it to the convention. They hemmed and hawed with various maneuvers to this end, finally, on the last day of the convention, submitting a proposal to exclude the Workers' Party on the grounds that it advocated the overthrow of the government, and asking all present except the Workers' Party to affiliate to the old moribund Fitzpatrick Farmer Labor Party. The convention delegates, of whom only a very small minority were communists, roared disapproval of this course, and by a vote of 500 to 40 established the originally planned Federated Farmer Labor Party, of which Joe Manley was elected secretary, whereupon Fitzpatrick and a handful of delegates walked out of the convention. Nearly all of his customary supporters, however, including such veterans as Alex Howitt, Duncan MacDonald, Mother Jones, etc., endorsed the Workers' Party line in the convention. They could not see the consistency of Fitzpatrick's first condemning the CPPA a couple of months earlier for not seating Workers' Party delegates and denouncing it as a scab organization for not launching a Labour Party and then suddenly switching front, taking essentially the same course himself in this big convention. Although supported by only a few delegates, nevertheless, the Fitzpatrick walkout became a real break. The capitalist papers helped it decisively by yelling split in a thousand headlines all over the country. This split, combined with the general trend of the AFL and organized farmers toward the candidacy of La Follette, prevented the growth of the newly organized Federated Farmer Labor Party, and it perished after a 12 months lingering existence. The Fitzpatrick Farmer Labor Party also soon died out, with its leaders turning back more and more to the AFL nonpartisan political policy. Fitzpatrick has many times since bitterly attacked the communists for the July 3rd split, but this is not in accordance with the facts. The main responsibility lay with himself. We simply stuck to the plan we had definitely agreed upon with Fitzpatrick before the convention of forming a new federated party. It was he who directly caused the split in his eagerness to break with the communists and to put himself in tune with the strong conservative trends developing at the time in the trade union movement. The worst that we can be fairly charged with was an error in tactics. As I have pointed out, Fitzpatrick and his group, feeling the upswing of prosperity and the growth of class collaboration, were at the time retreating rapidly to the right under Gomper's fire. This trend on their part was clearly demonstrated afterwards by Fitzpatrick's giving up the Labour Party movement altogether and reverting back to the AFL nonpartisan policy, by abandoning amalgamation, and by becoming a bitter enemy of the Soviet Union. He also became an ardent advocate of all subsequent AFL schemes of intensified class collaboration. Our failing was that we should have realized more clearly all this rightward trend and, instead of holding Fitzpatrick to his pre-convention agreement, made the greatest compromises in order, if possible, to avoid such an open and sharp break. The whole history of the next several years showed, with the progressives generally gone far to the right and becoming the leaders of the class collaboration movement, that the Workers' Party and TUEL, with their class struggle policy, were bound to have the greatest difficulty in carrying on any joint struggle whatever with them. Nevertheless, we should have fought more skillfully against the split. 
As it was, the split developed in the worst form, dramatically and around such a major issue as the Labor Party. The sequel showed that the Chicago split cost the Workers' Party loss of contacts with many important farmer labor militants in various sections of the country. It shattered the United Front combination that had done such effective work in the meatpacking and steel campaigns, and in the amalgamation, Labor Party, and other movements, and that held promise of important future activities. The AFL Counteroffensive the Chicago split in the united front between the communists and left progressives was manna from heaven to the threatened Gompers leaders, and they accepted it as a signal for a big offensive against the TUEL, the communists, and progressive movements generally. The first serious clash came at the Illinois Federation of Labor Convention in Decatur, September 10, 1923, at which I was a delegate. This was said to be the largest state federation convention ever held in the United States, the AFL having made a big mobilization of its forces to defeat us. Gompers had sent out a special letter condemning us and delegated Matthew Wool to lead the fight against us. The battle centered around the question of amalgamation, and it was a hot fight. The Fitzpatrick Farmer Labor Party delegates, very bitter at us for the Chicago split, joined forces openly with Wool, signed his statement condemning amalgamation, and helped vote down their own CFL amalgamation resolution. Result? Amalgamation was defeated by four to one vote, whereas three months before it would have been adopted by the same delegation with an overwhelming majority. This was the first time the AFL leaders had been able to defeat amalgamation in any state federation convention, and their jubilation knew no bounds. Just at this critical time, with the Gompers machine managing to get on the offensive against us, the socialist needle trades union leaders taught the right reactionaries a new trick in how to fight militant unionism. In the International Ladies' Garment Workers, where our movement was very strong, they began a campaign of expulsion of TUEL members in Chicago, New York, and elsewhere. They backed this up by suppressing free speech in the Union and infesting it with professional gangsters. To the socialist old guard leaders, to Sigmund in person, therefore belongs the shame of having initiated into the United States the reactionary policy, which they copied from their parent Amsterdam International, of expelling workers from labor unions and their jobs because of their political opinions. An attempt was made to give the color of justification to such expulsions by the absurd charge that the TUEL was a dual union. The reason for this ruthless attack was that the socialist leaders were extremely antagonistic to us. They were allied tightly with the Gompers bureaucracy and followed out its whole class collaboration policy. The Gompers' clique were quick to follow the lead given by the old guard socialist trade union leaders, and they proceeded to adopt the expulsion policy generally. They were determined to exterminate all rank-and-file opposition to their ruinous collaboration policies. They dramatized the expulsion policy at the Portland 1923 AFL convention, where with the bell, book, and candle, they demonstratively expelled from the convention William F. Dunn, TUEL National Committee member and regularly elected delegate of the Silver Bow, Butte, Montana, Trades Council. The TUEL was officially branded as a dual union and a call was issued for war against the communists in the unions. And although the majority of the organized workers had voted for amalgamation, a labor party, and Russian recognition, and the bulk of the organizations were definitely committed to one or all three of these issues, the reactionary leaders almost unanimously voted them all down, the Labour Party vote, for example, being 25,066 to 1,895. This most reactionary convention then capped its destructive work by adopting as Labour's constructive program the new schemes of class collaboration which were well nigh to destroy the unions during the next six years. Never was there a more flagrant violation of trade union democracy than the actions of the Portland AFL convention one of the last attended by the arch-reactionary Gompers before his death. The misleaders of labor served notice that henceforth there would be war to the knife against the TUEL, the communists, and every sign of militancy in the labor movement, and there was. After Portland, expulsion from unions and jobs, backed by gangster control and suppression of trade union democracy, became the official weapon against the militant opposition. The AFL leaders demanded that the Cleveland, Minneapolis, Detroit, Seattle, and other central labor unions expel all communist and TUEL members on pain of losing their charters. Then most of the international unions adopted the same policy, the socialist-controlled needle and trade unions outstripping all others in this reactionary campaign, wholesale expulsions in the needle industry even reaching the total of tens of thousands of workers in certain cases. 
In the early stages of the expulsion drive, the TUEL held its second national conference in Chicago, September 1, 1923, with 143 delegates from 90 cities, including three from Canada and one from Mexico. The convention took steps to speed up its three major campaigns and worked out concrete plans for partial and complete amalgamation in the most important industries. It also proposed to fight the growing expulsions by mass demands for reinstatement in the unions, but it was unable to find effective means to consolidate its loose mass movements in the face of the developing offensive of the Gompers bureaucracy. Under the pressure of the fierce attack of the top union leadership, in many cases supported by the bosses and the police, and under the influence of the growing prosperity and class collaboration, the TUEL forces in the unions were soon driven back. Hundreds of its best fighters lost their key union positions and also their jobs in the industries. Reaction and autocracy grew everywhere, and the movements for amalgamation, the Labour Party, and recognition of Soviet Russia suffered a heavy decline. In this time also, the workers' militancy fell off greatly. Gradually, the work of the TUEL in general slowed down and lost in mass volume. Its militants found themselves largely cut off from the organized workers, thus there ended the period of partial or relative isolation of the TUEL from the masses, a situation which was to last more or less as long as the Coolidge Prosperity Era, 1936. That's the end of Chapter 15. Thank you all for listening to the Workers' Reading Room. Hope you're all doing well. Have a good one.